Good evening and welcome to this evening's Grooseby meeting. Um, it's 6.30pm on Tuesday the 15th of February and for those listening and watching my name is Councillor Caroline Brook and I'm Chair of the Committee. I have a few housekeeping points to make before we begin. Please can um, I advise that the open parts of the meeting are being audio recorded and live streamed on the Council's website. In addition, a video recording of the meeting is being made and will be publicly available shortly afterwards. <clears throat> we have a mix of in-person and online participation today. And for those in the room, please can I ask you to speak clearly and remember to use your microphones, as always. For those online, um, please can I ask that you mute your microphones until you're asked to speak. Please can everyone ensure that mobile phones and other electronic devices are on silent or switched off entirely. And for those of us in the room, in the unlikely event that it's necessary to evacuate, Fire exits clearly labelled and proceed quickly to Abbey Gardens for the assembly point. Can I welcome the members of the public to the meeting? And I believe Mr. Wilson is here to speak to us this evening. Um, and from tax, we have Mr. Light and Mr. Chafe, who are here to listen to the debate on the HRA budget. But if you do wish to make a contribution, you'll be more than welcome to do so. Mr. Wilson, when we get to the public participation on the agenda, um, if you'd like to come forward to the empty desk just there, um, press the large button on the base of the microphone and you'll have three minutes to speak to us. We have several officers with us this evening, both in the room online and several cabinet members have joined us also, so welcome to everyone present. Coming on to the agenda, um, uh, apologies and deputy members. Good evening, Chair. Thank you. Um, all members of the committee are present, with the exception of Councillor Lumley, who's been replaced by Councillor Godfrey this evening. Hey, thanks, Councillor Godfrey, for stepping in. Um, <clears throat> do we have any declarations of interest? <coughs> no? OK, so we come on to item three, which is announcements. So I'd just like to say you'll have noticed the date change to our March meeting, which has moved from the 10th to the 3rd of March. And I appreciate date changes often cause difficulties for people. Um, but the committee had to, um, had been asked to scrutinise the outcome of the disposal of open space advertisement and associated report with respect to the University of Southampton proposal before it's considered by Cabinet in March. And I felt it was very important that we as scrutiny got sight of that. Therefore, I agreed the date of the meeting could be changed to the 3rd um, as Cabinet is on the 9th of March, which is after our scheduled meeting. Uh, I'm also grateful to Chief Inspector John Turton, who's been able to accommodate the change for us, so we're very, very grateful for him. Um, and this means that our agenda for the 3rd of March meeting is now Annual Community Safety Partnership, followed by the Land Transaction Report and Quarterly Performance Report. On tonight's agenda, we have an item... We have an item on uh, the agenda um, which um, from the monitoring officer regarding the calling um, on the previous cabinet decision in respect of this proposed land transaction. It's just for noting by the committee, but for ease of the meeting, I'll take the minutes next um, and then invite Mr. Wilson to address the committee and then take item 10, um, the monitoring officer report. So, item, oh, Councillor Horrell. Um, Chair, if I may, um, a point that you've made about changing dates. Um, can I make a formal request to you and those you're discussing dates with going forward that um, we've had a rather difficult year with changes of dates throughout and they haven't really married with the decisions that the Council has, need to, has needed to make um, and the progress through to Cabinet and Council. Um, and if scrutiny is to be a valid function, I think we need to be really clear uh, that we have due time to have the debate and not be passing over our information within hours of discussing it because it doesn't give those receiving it a chance to really absorb it or indeed take any points on board. So when we're planning the schedule of the calendar for the year, um, I think it would be helpful if you were able to make that point uh, that this is a really important committee and we need to be cognizant that there will perhaps be tensions, but we need to allow for that when we make the calendar for the year. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Councillor Hall, and, and, and I agree, we have moved meetings several times this year um, to accommodate various different items of business. So that's noted that we should try and um, focus on the schedule next year to try and um, alleviate that as an issue. Um, and also I, I recall a previous meeting where people were saying it was too close to the cabinet meeting. So I appreciate your comments, thank you. So coming on to item four, meeting of the um, 6th of December, meeting 2021. Have you all had a chance to view those and say, well, I agree. <coughs> Fabulous, thank you. So on to public participation, Mr. Wilson. So um, as you've heard, the matter that I believe you're speaking on this evening will be heard at the 3rd of March committee. So we'll take away your comments this evening, if that's okay, and, and alert them to that. So, if you'd like to begin, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, uh, Council team. At the last four Council meeting, I asked a question of the Leader with regard to an unprecedented number of successful judicial review proceedings which challenged decisions about land control by the Council, including the concession that the Cabinet decision regarding River Park site had been unlawful. The reply was surprising. I was told the number of cases since 2018, which the Leader for some reason considered to be a relevant recent period, showed that the Council had successfully defended more than double the cases they had conceded. The editorial comment in the following day's Hampshire Chronicle said this, it is not the first time that the Council has been threatened with or faced legal action for a decision that it had made about the future of publicly owned land. Surely the Council should have learned its lesson by now and would have checked with its legal team before going ahead with a decision that will impact residents in the city. As the Friends of River Park say in our front page story, a lot of time and money has been wasted by the Council in dealing with the legal challenges. The Council highlights that it successfully defended more cases than it conceded, but this does not seem something like it should be boasting about. Surely a good brag would be to say that it has not been taken to court at all. Following several major unsuccessful legal challenges, Silver Hill Station Approach, a housing development in Wickham, the Voltex site, and now the River Park decision, there has been no change in approach, no resignation by cabinet members except after Silver Hill, no change in consultants and no desire to pull back from, from com confrontation with the city's residents. It would seem that there is no acknowledgement of the mistakes made and only a determination by the administration to press ahead with scant regard to civic responsibility, democracy and lawfulness. The Scrutiny Committee plays a very important function in scrutinising the Council's decision and proposed actions. I ask you to demand of the Administration that a different course is taken from now on, ensuring that decisions are taken which are based on effective communication with residents and thus invite consensus rather than confrontation. This will, for example, recall a calling a halt to the River Park proposals for a proper public consultation to be held. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I appreciate your time this evening. So, as indicated earlier on, when I mentioned we'll then go to um, item 10 um, to go to the monitoring officer regarding the call in request. Um, Mrs. Kirkman, are you online? <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Mr. Kirk. I thanked you just now. It's been a long day. You guys stand outside the room. Turn my. So, um, it's recommended that the scrutiny committee note the contents of the report. Um, does anybody have any comments they'd like to make on this at all? Councillor Hall. Um, uh, Chair, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure you're not surprised that um, I suppose the question is that we asked for the River Park decision to come um, <clears throat> to scrutiny and um, we put various recommendations which the monitoring officer uh, did not um, accept. However, since then, the Cabinet has had to rescind its decision 
on uh, the progress uh, because of a, 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 a technical um, uh, error. And obviously, um, now we wait to see what the next step will be. In the meantime, obviously, um, the administration has received hundreds of objections to the proposal um, as outlined by the University of Southampton, not really by uh, Winchester City Council when they uh, briefed us uh, recently. And residents are um, rightly asking for um, consultation. And this committee would have been a great opportunity for that important decision to have been reviewed, just as we did with the CWR proposal, and you're recommending for, for uh, River Park next month. But uh, to have not taken that opportunity at the end of last year, I think, is unfortunate. And I suppose my question to um, uh, the administration and indeed to the officers is, is there a learning here for all of us in how decisions are made um, of such significance at the council? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, I, I can help in terms of the mechanisms of the calling <clears throat> and how that's presented to me. So, Councillor Hall is, of course, correct that there was an error in advertising the disposal of open space prior to the decision being made. But that was not one of the grounds for calling that the signatories put to me. Um, and I have been really clear that it is both not my role to defend a decision that's made by Cabinet, but nor is it my role to find reasons to accept a calling that have been not, not been put before me by the signatories. And the signatories did not refer to the duty to advertise the disposal of open space. That was not in the calling. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. Any other comments on this? Councillor Fox. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wonder whether um, Mrs. Clegman, you could offer some more information on how important it is for when uh, opposition councillors feel that there's a need for calling, that they actually discuss this or they engage with cabinet members or the leader about that prior to doing that calling, because that was a comment that you made in that report. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Councillor Ferguson. So there are procedurals that relate to callings as set out in parts 4.3 of the Constitution, and that does state that um, any member considering calling a decision in must first make every effort to discuss the issue with the relevant cabinet member, and uh, I received confirmation from the cabinet member that had not happened in this case. Thank you. Um, if there's no other comments, are we happy to note this? Right. Thank you. Um, right, so coming on to the main agenda this evening, item six, we've got the um, housing revenue account, pages 11 to 32 um, of report reference SC059 and CAB 3334. Um, recommendation is it's recommended that the scrutiny committee comment on the proposals in the attached cabinet report, Ref Cab 3334, which is to be considered by the cabinet at its meeting on the 17th of February 2022. We have Councillor Lanny, uh, Mrs. Nye, and Mr. Johnson in the room, and of course, Tax, if you if you wish to comment, by all means come forward and um, and, and make your comments. Um, so, who's introducing this, Councillor Lanny? Is that you? Uh, Mrs. Knight, introducing it. Mrs. Knight, please. Thank you, Chair. This report requests approval for the proposed HRA revenue budget for 2022-23. The Cabinet reviewed the draft 30-year uh, HRA business plan and budget options at its meeting in October 2021. At that meeting, Cabinet considered representations from TACT and agreed to recommend a rent increase of 3.1% rather than the 4.1% initially approved in line with the government's rent formula. This is in recognition of a number of factors around significant increases elsewhere, such as energy costs, transport costs, and the cost of living, as well as the ongoing impact of the pandemic. This has an impact of 29 million over the life of the business plan. However, the plan remains sustainable over the period. CAB 334 <coughs> confirms that proposal and also sets out the HRA budget for 22 23 
an HRA capital programme for the next 10 years. The HRA budget includes additional provision of 500,000 to fund additional repairs and works to empty properties with a view to improving the void standard properties are brought up to before letting. Homes always meet the decent home standard, but our void standard is currently below that of neighbouring registered providers and can mean significant additional burdens for new tenants. The enhanced property void standard will make properties more appealing and attractive to advertise and provide local high quality council homes to rent. The budget also includes an additional 300k to fund, to fund additional staff to improve capacity for tenant engagement, for delivering the repairs programme and for managing new homes. The proposed strengthening of staffing capacity within the housing service will increase opportunities to invest in community development and tenant, in, and tenant engagement, supporting our role as a landlord in keeping neighbourhoods clean and safe to live in. The capital programme includes 258 million to fund a thousand new homes over the next 10 years and a further 119 million to maintain and improve existing homes and neighbours over the same period. The, HR budget, the HRA budget is based on a 30-year business plan that is both viable and sustainable over this period of time. I'm quite happy to take questions but I'm glad to say that Dick Johnson is always also online to assist me with the more technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Knight. Um, so we'll go to questions initially on the uh, main body of the report. Um, does anybody have any questions on the main body of the report? Councillor Parrell. Thank you, Chairman. I have two. Uh, regarding 11.4, which is on page 20, uh, the Council has set aside 500,000 to fund a number of wealth, welfare support initiatives could we have an explanation of what those have been spent on this year and how much of the fund has been being used up? Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, we haven't uh, sufficiently fun, uh, spent all of the fund this year simply because it is a, a setting up of the programme. As you know, three members of staff were, um, were needed to, to provide that support, a financial inclusion officer, a health and wellbeing officer and administrator. We are, we are far wrong with that. We now have um, three of those gone through the recruitment process. We have spent money currently on things like school uniforms, white goods, uh, we've helped somebody get a license for their taxi to, to, to keep them in employment, um, various things through the personalisation budget. We are hoping to, um, well we will be spending a lot more of the budget this year and we hope to be able to uh, bring a report back with a, a more positive response as to what we've spent. But it is making huge difference to those that we are helping and it's good to have that, that fund available to us. Oh, sorry, yes, she did. Um, this was on 11.6 regarding the um, hard to let properties, two bedroom flats. Sorry, what on the point? Sorry, regarding the two bedroom flats and the difficulty of lift, uh, letting them, what are the other factors apart from the void standard that make them hard to let this? I think there's a number of factors. Recently, we've had many other registered providers building properties within the district, so we've seen a lot of properties come online. We're also, uh, our own, our other housing partners and registered providers are also experiencing the, the difference of trying to let two bed properties. Another issue perhaps, um, or, or factor, is that our Hampshire Home Choice Register is a little bit more interactive now, a bit, a bit more, in, um, and, and it actually tells you where you are and how long it will take you. And, it, and if you're looking to bid on a two-bed property, it will tell you that if you waited for a two-bed house, it might only be six months, because at the moment, obviously, we've got a high supply of them. So I think there's several factors. And of course, the obvious one of people really wanting that open space now when, they, when they're bidding for properties, that's a green area. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Knight. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I also have two, two questions. Um, I'll ask the question about the voice first. Um, on those two bed properties, again, um, is there any opportunity to um, rework 
those two bed properties to an extent that, you know, to rework them so that they could end up being amalgamated to make a larger property. I know there are many families that I speak to who tell me that they're, they started out in a two bed and they snipped. They've now had two children, possibly three, and they can't make the next step. So is there an opportunity to reconfigure? Is there hard to let? That's the first question and then the second one. Okay. Thank you. It isn't something we've we've explored in, in fairness. I think a lot of the two bed flats, it may well be difficult to do that um, because of the way in which they are often within a block and, and you know there will be tenants on each side. But it's certainly something we can sit we could consider. I think the, the main area we're concentrating at the moment is on the actual standard of the void. So trying to make it um, possible for tenants to move in and not have that financial burden of perhaps uh, floor uh, furnishings. So perhaps looking at carpets. Certainly looking at. I know. I know both my por my portfolio and shadow um, portfolio holder will be pleased to hear that showers and uh, lots of different different things that would really make it more um, attractive. So we are looking more around the, the sort of standard. But that's certainly something I could take back to the property team to explore at each point. Certainly. If, if I can add to that, um, at the moment we also have relatively small short waits for three bedroomed homes within the district. So those who qualify because they're overcrowded um, should certainly be looking at um, getting back onto the Hampshire Home Choice system. Um, thank you. Can I ask a second? Um, I also note, um, and, I, and I welcome this additional funding um, for the 500,000 for the fares replacement um, and also the voice to increase the <coughs> standard. Um, I just wondered, is it enough? Because um, I note in 11.6 that you indicate 300k will actually be used to meet just inflationary pressures. And obviously with our climate emergency and our desire to <coughs> make sure that we make um, adjustments to make houses you know, better insulated, um, you know, more efficient in terms of cost of heating, etc. Whether that actually is is enough to do all of those things. Thank you. Chair, if I can just just comment on that. Well, I, th I think that will depend on um, what members determine the void standard to be. So if you set the standard to um, very high, it will we'll need, we'll need more than the two hundred thousand. But I think we, we can frame a void standard and take that through the policy committee around. These are the options we feel we could deliver um, with, within the funds that have been, been made available. Um, I think we can do a lot with that with, with that money. We can make a significant difference. Up, 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 off the top of my head, we spent about um, yeah, that would be getting on for between 10 and 20 percent of the void budget. So it's quite a significant increase on the void budget. Um, so so I'm, I'm confident that we can bring forward decent proposals, but that will depend on, on final decisions on what that standard looks like. Councillor Hall. Chair, I have several questions, um, uh, if, if I may. Um, the first one is around the housing white paper, which is an important new piece of information for us in terms of how we conduct business. And um, I uh, see that we're indicating we're setting up a fund uh, to help support those initiatives. Um, can um, the Director of Services actually help us to understand what is in her mind um, at this point um, and how we might um, uh, see changes as a result of this. Thank you. Yes, we are actually bringing a paper to Business Housing and Policy Committee in March outlining the changes that we're, we'll be making to the Neighbourhood and Estates team. It's looking exactly as the um, the white paper is very clear that we need to be very visible on our on our neighbour on our neighbourhoods that we need to be listening to our tenants. And we also need to be engaging them to ensure that they're they're leading our services. So a lot of it will be ten, tenant engagement around perhaps walk around the estates, looking at where we can best um, pick up um, things that are being missed, perhaps. And it will also mean an opportunity for us to work with local ward members and tenants for them to show us some of the issues that they're facing. I think that's really important to make sure that our perhaps our presence is known a bit more than it has been in the past in having perhaps not so much dedicated officers, but officers that are very clear when they're going to be on the states to be able to engage with tenants. 
we're trying to look at the thing, at the sort of fun things that we can do around you know, the, the um, engagement where we're, we're able to get some feedback, um, but, but doing the kind of um, coffee mornings and things like that. So we're looking to, to really go back to that um, more interactive offer with it complemented with our digital surveys, which have been a huge success in reaching a wider demographic to, to reach those younger people to get feedback from them too. So a bit of both, but also very much around making sure our, our estates are safe and, and clean, as I said. So, Chair, can I just ask one of the um, areas that I think we've had feedback from tenants um, throughout the last year is the neighbourhood services team needing additional resources. Um, and obviously there are um, additional monies in for uh, staffing, but um, could um, uh, Mrs. Knight reassure us that we're reinvesting in that area um, as part of this overall new approach or revised approach? We are indeed. We have we have two new neighbourhood um, officers now, uh, if, if, if uh, proposed in the paper, and, and if that's agreed by Cabinet, then we will have two new um, neighbourhood support officers, and they will be very much focused on engagement. Chair, can I keep mm -hmm. going? Is that absolutely okay? I'm not um, keeping anyone else from asking. Um, uh, it's already been touched on by um, uh, two previous councillors, and that's the void standard. Um, our void uh, period has extended extensively in the last um, uh, year or so, and I know we've obviously had uh, COVID to deal with, uh, but nonetheless, turning our properties is important, but also setting, setting the standard of what we expect those properties to deliver. Um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify with Mrs Knight how um, uh, the new standards are going to be articulated. Are, are members going to be asked to participate? We've discussed kitchens and bathrooms at, at length in this room um, on previous occasions, but um, are members and indeed tenants going to be asked for their views on what good might look like? Thank you. Yes, that will be an important part of, of the programme. So once the funding is is approved, then we'll certainly, we'll certainly be looking at uh, small focus groups with tenants through the tenant involvement team and, and certainly member involvement too. We'll bring, we'll bring proposals to you. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions? No, Chair, I do have more. Sorry, I see this as a really question, but um, if other members want to ask, I'm happy to. Councillor Godfrey then, and then we'll go to Councillor Grimmelson and then come back Thank to you, Councillor Chairman. I wonder if um, uh, the officers could advise me. <coughs> um, the decision uh, not to uh, conform uh, to increase rents by the government uh, recommended uh, level, 4.1%, uh, <coughs> which you said um, uh, throws um, an increase of 3.1%. Uh, I note on the paper um, is going to mean over Certainly, a program period um, uh, and reduced funding for the HRA um, would, would have been sufficient to build 58 new affordable homes um, and um, will cost uh, the HRA um, uh, seven and a half million pounds in uh, reduced income. Um, uh, we fail to uh, now look will not have. Um, what, apart from the affordable housing, which would be valuable to uh, a lot of um, uh, families, what uh, will the HRA not be able to do um, by making a decision um, to go with the lower um, interest rate rather than the um, government recommended rate of the increase? Mr. Boston, Councillor Hong, can you just switch up your microphone? Oh, sorry, thank you. <clears throat> so I don't know if Councillor Lerner wants to add a bit of it. Um, we, did, we did include in the report the, um, the impact of, um, of, of not taking that decision. Uh, I did meet with TACT before the Cabinet meeting, explain to them in some detail about the options open to them, that we could invest more in services. Um, in recent meetings, TACT had raised concerns about the quality of benefit services. Um, this report addresses some of those, but we could have invested more in that with 
with a 4.1% increase compared to a 3.1%. Tap fully appreciated that point and, and, and still made their representations to Cabinet. <coughs> Cabinet fully considered that point as well, I think, at the same time. So, so that information was available. Obviously, you could build more homes, you could provide more services. Um, that's that's the, the, the context that the, the, the decision was taken in. Um, the key point is the 30-year business plan remains sustainable with the plans that were uh, in, included within it. So that was what supported that decision. But Councillor Adeline, I don't want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, at a time when uh, people are facing a cost of living crisis, we felt it was only appropriate to um, consult on the options around rents. Um, however, we were very uncomfortable um, Councillor Godfrey has raised the issues very clearly of a, an increase below 3.1%, which was at least at a, an inflation level, but does impact on what we can do in the future. So I think it's important we recognise that any further reduction will start causing us issues over the long term. Uh, we did also bring those options back to um, this scrutiny committee um, last year and asked for their opinion and Cabinet um, followed the recommendation which came from this committee at that time. Absolutely, Councillor, and we did all agree on that. Um, Councillor Cromoyson. Thank you. Um, now, in, a, in a, a plan like this and in, in the model that you've got behind the figures, you have to put a number on things like inflation and things like growth, uh, otherwise the model doesn't work. But I think we all know that inflation is rearing its ugly head again. So I just wonder what kind of sensitivity analysis has been done on the model to look at, you know, what if inflation is significantly higher uh, than we expect over, say, the next two to three years? And if that happens, what are, what are your biggest concerns around the impact on services um, and potentially you know, additional, additional additions to the estate? Um, uh, so just really just to understand what that potential impact is, not trying to challenge the call that you've made. Chair, if I just pick up on that, but I may ask uh, Dick Johnson if he can be ready for a, a supplementary, if that's okay. Um, just put him on warning. But, um, the, the business plan model that sits behind the budget um, assumes that rents keep pace with inflation. At, at least. So I think the base assumptions are that it's the, the, the national policy of inflation plus one for the next five years. Um, so the decision that was taken, that is being recommended as part, already takes us away from that a little bit, but it was afford considered to be affordable. Um, but it does rely on at least, at least keeping pace with inflation. Any uh, continued below inflation rent increases will have a significant impact on the business plan. Um, so so that, that, that's the, the, the key assumption on which it uh, on, on which is based, but Dick, if you're if you're able to articulate some of the sensitivity sensitivity analysis that goes on behind the scenes as well, that'd be helpful. Yes, um, yes. thank you, Richard. Um, so essentially, the, the model is a thirty year model. We do it annually, and the assumptions are reviewed annually. Um, I think you're right. I mean, the inflation that we've assumed long term is two percent in the model. But obviously at the moment it's running quite high. So we'll be looking at it again next year and see what impact that has. Um, a large proportion of the, um, the sensitivity is around delivering new homes in terms of borrowing and interest rates around borrowing, which may go up if inflation is high as well. So there are some sensitivities which will impact on the model. But as I say, because we do it annually, it, um, it is a fair reflection of what the, the position is when we do it in November of each year. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> Councillor Horrell, we're coming back to you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in 14.5, it mentions the stock condition survey will be updated in due course, and that obviously gives us an important benchmark. Um, when is due course, please? <laughs> um, I'd need to take that back and find out, Councillor Horrell, and we'll come back to you with that. Um, thank you. Um, Chair, another one on disabled grants, which are obviously uh, an important part of our work and for some uh, individuals and families means that people do not have to move to an institution, their homes can be adapted, often um, 
some expense, but it become it stays their home and they don't have to move. Um, and obviously that's a very involved piece of work, but an important um, element of what we do to support um, our tenants. Um, could I just double check um, with Mrs. Knight that um, that work and those resources to deliver that um, are uh, clearly built into the plan uh, for next year um, and that we have, as I say, uh, the correct resources to be able to um, allocate those monies um, and follow those projects through. Thank you. Yes, I can assure you that still remains a priority and we have a sufficient budget. We are seeing um, a slight change in that people are looking uh, for extensions now, so it is becoming quite costly. But we've certainly, as a landlord, we, we do invest in, in disabled facility grants and we certainly try to keep those in their home where possible. Thank you. Is that all of your questions? Um, I'm afraid I have one, one more share, which is 14.8. Um, um, and the ongoing investment requirement in sewage treatment works, uh, which are um, a really tough assignment for us because we're not sewage experts. Um, however, they're an important part of the facilities that we um, have to deliver. And um, it, is, it is not it's a, it's a significant amount of money. Um, and again, I'm just questioning whether, uh, and I, I, uh, I'm afraid I might know the answer to this, but is, is there any other way of doing this uh, without um, that level of investment? Um, I, clearly, it's a facility we, we cannot um, ignore, but uh, as I say, we're not, um, we're not experts in this world. So, um, but it, as I say, 14.8 is, is very significant. Thank you. Councillor Lally. Um, thank you. Yes, I'm afraid, Councillor Hall, you do know the answer to this already, which is that we have um, been investing um, over actually decades uh, in order to bring our sewage treatment works up to adopt all standards um, in the hope that we could um, persuade uh, Southern Water to take them on as part of their much wider um, sewerage works. So clearly putting it much more in the hands of the experts. Um, unfortunately, uh, they have refused over time to engage with that and to take any of these works on, which I think if you look at their financial modelling probably makes sense from their point of view. But this is a burden which I think we're going to have to bear, but we will keep these up to standard, make sure that we're keeping them um, as well maintained as we possibly can and keep meeting the improving standards that people are expecting um, of these kind of works. Thank you. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Can I come back to page 20, 11.4, to follow on from Councillor Power? With regard to the welfare support initiatives, um, in the money that's been spent thus far this year, are we at a point where we know for sure that that will all be spent and if I may sort of follow on with a second question if, if it's not spent will that money automatically then be carried on to the following year if I may ask that thank you yes we have we had um, an initial spending plan of two years but that has been extended to three and yes, I do believe once we're fully staffed, I, I do believe I'll be coming back next year with it. I've got a quite sufficient spend. There are four areas in which we intend to use the grant, which is strategic commissioning, so helping people getting back into employment, helping people with their mental health, looking at therapeutic um, support. We're also looking at digital inclusion to help those access the services that they really need to be able to do now through universal credit. Uh, welfare personalisation budget, which I've touched on, where we'll buy people and help them when they move in, and also our, our staffing resources. So I really do believe it will be a fund that will be very, you know, really utilised by our tenants, and we have got a bit of a bumpy road ahead of us. So I do think next year we will there will be sufficient spend of the fund. I'm very grateful to have it. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions on the main report? No. Okay. On to Appendix A. Um, page 26 um, onwards, 26 and 27. Um, does anybody have any questions on Appendix A? Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, Chair. 
Um, just on Appendix A, um, I was looking at the um, repairs administration as a percentage cost of overall repairs, <clears throat> and it comes in at a roughly 20%. And I just wondered um, whether that's quite high and whether we have a benchmark um, our administration of repairs against other local authorities. Thank you. Thank you. I would um, defer to you know, to get, to get to Dick, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that does include the repairs administration of, of responsive repairs that are in, in this budget, but also the plan maintenance costs as well, which are in the capital programme. So we don't capitalise our staffing costs as, as part of that work. So, and, and if I've said the wrong thing there, Dick, you'll correct me, I'm sure. Yeah, then you're perfectly correct. The, the property services staff are charged to um, to revenue, so they're part of that cost as well. And there are quite a large number of um, staff who are managing the client side. Sorry, and the other part of the question is whether we've ever benchmarked those figures against other local authorities? Uh, we, we do do annual benchmarking exercises with Housemark, yes. Do. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to find the, the costs at the moment. The costs are quite um, quite high compared to other authorities, I think. Does that answer your question, Mr. Ferguson? So, can I just have a supplementary? If our costs are relatively high in comparison, do, do we know why? Thank you. Uh, it's one of those things that we're still looking at. Um, it's difficult to actually compare like with like in benchmarking, and there are a number of areas where um, costs are out of line with um, neighbouring authorities or similar authorities. Chair, it is something that I think we, we can um, give further information to, to, to members on once we've completed that investigation. Uh, historically, we were always below average. We've always reported in our annual report attendance that uh, costs of repairs administration was below average. They're currently showing is above average, and we need to understand why. Mm. Thank you for that question. Does anybody else have any questions on appendix one? Councillor Laurel. Um, Chair, on appendix one, um, homelessness um, is uh, clearly a, a important duty for us, <coughs> and many people. Um, uh, confuse those who decide to rough sleep with being homeless. However, uh, we do suffer from that in the city in particular. Um, and outreach is uh, a key part of the work conducted and indeed um, programmes to take people on their pathway from homelessness through to hopefully a secure tenancy. So my question is, um, and I don't read very much about this or see significant numbers in the budget that are allocated to this area unless they're tucked away in other headings. Um, I'd be grateful, therefore, if Mrs Knight could just explain to us that we have got this important area of our work well resourced from a, um, a, a staffing um, grants to other agencies who work with us without whom uh, we couldn't provide all of the services that we do um, and um, that uh, uh, we have um, uh, everything in place to be able to maintain that responsibility. Thank you, Chair. Chair, yeah, just a point of, point of clarification. Uh, we, fund, we fund homeless prevention through the general fund and through our homeless prevention fund grant. Um, which is separate to this paper. So the homelessness provision budget in this paper is specifically related to the management of hostels. So the, the HRA is, uh, doesn't have responsibilities for homelessness, the general fund does. So, so this is, that, that line in the paper is part of the special services that we operate. We operate hostels funded, the, the hostels are, uh, their temporary accommodation is managed by, uh, but through the HRA, it should be a self-funding service. So that line should read as a zero. Um, because otherwise, it, you know, that, that's actually showing that the wider tenants are paying um, have some some cost of also hostels. So that's our objective of that, of that line. But certainly, as far as the wider homeless prevention services are concerned, a report is coming to Business and Housing Policy Committee on the first of March with proposals to spend across uh, across the homeless prevention fund. So you'll see a lot more detail of what's proposed. Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, Chair, can I just clarify that because obviously the budget will be set by then, um, um, and it's not clear to me that level of detail in the general fund paper. So, um, is it is there anything else that you can help or Council Lerny uh, before that that budget is set so that we can have a very good understanding of that <coughs> level of activity? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think we've been um, fortunate um, in being able to really utilise well the government funding that's been coming forward uh, for homelessness prevention. I think we were already in a very good position as a local authority. Um, you worked very hard at it when you were holding this portfolio. Um, so we found ourselves in a very good position in terms of what we were able to do in the area of homelessness. Um, while it may not show in the um, general fund budget itself, uh, we do have significant funds available still for this area of work. We're working very closely with our partners, uh, particularly Trinity and Beacon in that area. And we're looking, working with them to look at how we can further improve the services. We're, I mean, if anything, we're already finding next to nobody sleeping out, which is making outreach quite difficult in some ways, uh, but we know that the sofa surfers and all the rest of them are out there. There is always more that we can be doing. But um, no, so um, hopefully we can reassure you that we do not need to be allocating extra funding from the general fund to that area at this point in time. Um, and that will come back to, to business and housing. In fact, I think you may see the paper before we approve the budget. I'm not quite sure what the timetable Yes, no, it's sorry, it will, it will be slightly after. It will be a week after. Oh, right, okay. But, but, what, but what it is, is the Homeless and Prevention Fund, which we, we received 300,000 from the government, and the report being coming to policy committee is a spending plan for that 300,000. So members will have to be able to, to shape that with, with offices, and that will then go on to cabinet in June. So, that, that, so the money is secured, it's really how we spend that money, I think, is what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on Appendix 1? No, Appendix 2 then, page 28. Any questions specifically on Appendix 2? No, Appendix 3. Appendix 4. Mm -hmm. Council Ferguson. <clears throat> I just have a brief one on Appendix 3. I'm just getting to the right place. Um, I just noticed on the estates improvement that the figure dropped dramatically um, from what it was um, in the budget. Can you see it's got 507, then 150, 226, 239, and goes back up to 460. Um, and I just wondered um, why, why that was. <coughs> so that's the estates improvement line. Uh, I think I can answer that. Um, the reason is that the Estates Improvement Programme is um, giving £416,000 to the Windall development, and the money is being wired from that budget in 22, 23, and 23, 24, which is why the budget's gone down. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, my question was on Appendix 4. Um, <clears throat> two questions. One is, um, have we secured the deal with Carla Holmes to bring forward um, definitely the Barton Farm investment in 23-24? Um, or is that still uh, being debated um, uh, for the provision of extra care? And um, we've obviously had a number of projects that have been delayed um, from the original anticipation, uh, anticipated um, sort of spend in 21-22. Um, uh, obviously, uh, COVID has affected um, what we, how speedily we can do it and resources. Um, but is a, do we have the right resources in place to ensure the level of activity um, and project management and the like that we need to bring all of these uh, very important developments forward and to maintain the drive for 
additional homes that we've set ourselves. Thank you, Chair. Dick, can I defer to you for that answer? Um, so the, the, the funding is certainly there for the new homes team to fund um, its staffing levels. At the moment, though, obviously they've got a few um, issues in terms of recruitment and retention. So they're going through a period at the moment of um, uh, looking to recruit staff to some of the vacant positions. And we're obviously anticipating that they will be successful in this uh, during 22-23. Chairman, if I may add um, to that, we um, we have been successful in recruiting a, a very experienced senior surveyor who joins us, I think, next week, if he doesn't want to join us, um, who, who is well known to us. So we're really pleased that, uh, that he's, he's joining us. They'll make a big difference to the team. And we are currently out to, to advert for a senior new homes project manager as well. So that's um, with, and we've, and we've had good interest there. So uh, yes, we've got some positive, positive steps forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, and my other question. Sorry, yeah, sorry. I was ready to, to come in to Thank answer you. the other question. <laughs> uh, discussions are ongoing with Carla, but we do have a, a high degree of um, certainty that that will go ahead. Yes. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're seeing uh, build costs uh, going through the roof on other projects at the moment. To what extent is, is this uh, program um, inflation proofed and cost inflation proofed for, for the next 10 years? Do we feel it's adequate and uh, are we ready to um, adjust to, to things that are coming down at us in that area? We, 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 have, we have good provision in the program, um, so they are based on our latest projections. We also have a significant amount of unallocated resource there, so some, 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 some giving it so that uh, if costs were to increase, then members have some flexibility to meet those increased costs. It will always be subject to a judgment then as to whether you consider a scheme to be viable or not, um, because the program is funded from the rental income from those homes. So effectively, you know, we borrow, we charge a rent, the rent pays the borrowing. Um, and if costs increase significantly, then schemes may become more difficult to prove, to make viable. And that, that will be the challenge moving forward. Certainly, um, we'd love all of our cover programs to be inflation proof, I'm afraid, but that's not our experience at the moment. We are we're seeing significant changes um, <coughs> every time we put something to tender. Sorry, Councillor Wade, does that answer your question? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask, um, it's Appendix 3 actually, and it's to do with the fire safety provision. And as I look at the table, um, there's a number of numbers there, and then it goes down in 2022-2023 budget, 680, and then we have lots of zeros. I just wondered, um, could somebody talk me through that, please? That's the fire safety provision. Thank you. Dick, are you able to take that question? Yes, certainly. So um, as I understand it, having spoken with Andrew Kingston, this is the funding that's sufficient to actually um, complete the replacement of the uh, fire safety doors, which um, are in progress at the moment. They are the fire doors for leaseholders at Wooden Flats, which where we are trying. We, the offer has gone out and we've had a good response to that. If, if I can add to that, um, clearly we do have a fire safety programme which relates not only to Grenfell and high buildings, but also a general fire safety programme which has been developed um, in consultation with the tenants. Um, over the next few years, we have clearly a high level of spend, which is principally around the fire doors, which prioritises the Winnell Flats, which are our highest buildings but also covers doors in other, in other flats as well. Um, once we uh, reach the end of that programme, we will still be doing fire safety work. So I'd like to reassure you, Councillor Cook, because I think that was the direction of travel on this, that the spending on fire safety wasn't going to disappear, but it will just be absorbed into the general maintenance budget. Thank you. Any other questions on Appendix 4? All three. Councillor Crest. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, apologies if it goes back a bit. So we're not increasing to 4.1%. Uh, 
Um, and that's an impact over a lifetime of some of 7.5 million. What's the annual loss by not increasing? And apologies if, if we covered this in the last meeting. We did cover this in the last in the last meeting. I think you'd have to you'd have to ask Mr. Johnson for an exact figure on that because I can't recollect it off the top of my head. <coughs> Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't got that to hand. I'll have to come back and confirm what it is. Thank you, Mr Johnson. OK, Appendix 5. Any questions on Appendix 5? <coughs> no, and Appendix 6, finally. No, OK. Um, can I ask our tax members at the back either of you would like to make any comments or ask any questions at this time? No? No, I think more like thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, um, right to buy receipts, the number for 22-23. Um, could someone just explain that number, which is significantly out of kilter with um, recent numbers? Thank you. Dick, are you able to respond? Thank you. Yes, sorry, Councillor Horrell. Where are you looking? Um, appendix, sorry, Appendix 5, right to buy 141 receipts. Right. I see. Revised yes. budget for September 2 million, but the budget for 22-23 is 6.6. I see. Yes. So so this is the um, it's a bit confusing, but this is the funding schedule. So this is how we intend to fund the programme of works. And at the moment, obviously, our focus is on applying um, one for one receipts in um, that we can around uh, new homes development and also funding the rest of it through borrowing. So the, the reason the one for one receipts are low is because of the actual uh, spend we can apply um, them to, which is 30 percent or 40 percent of um new build so that that's the latest forecast for 21 22 that we're going to spend just under 2 million and next year of course we've got a much larger program so we're anticipating applying 6.6 .6 million next year and could you just um maybe i'm out of date but isn't there a timeline on when you have to spend those monies aren't we restricted on how long we can keep those um for that purpose there, there is indeed, but they um, they changed the um, the rules around it and gave us more flexibility. So we now have five years to spend um, right to buy receipts and we can apply them to both affordable housing and shared ownership. And we can apply them instead of 30 percent of eligible spend. We can now apply them up to 40 percent. So there's much more freedom and flexibility in terms of using and applying the right to buy receipts. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no further questions on this paper, do we have any debate? Any debate on this paper? Nope. OK, then I'll bring us back to the recommendation that... Oh, apologies, Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, I want to say thank you to the officers and to Councillor Learning for actually the, um, the paper today. I think it's a hugely important part of the work of the council. It's an enormous amount of money um, in terms of our, our overall budgets. Um, and we clearly deliver a, a, a much needed service to our tenants. I hope David uh, and David uh, would, would agree um, that um, uh, we uh, do try our very best to do that. So um, as I say, a note of thanks to those who've done all of the hard work to get us to this and uh, look forward to uh, working with everyone on delivering it for next year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Horrell. Um, so coming back to the recommendation that was that we uh, comment on the proposal, so I think we've given it a fair airing, and I too would like to thank the um, housing team as a whole for always being fabulously supportive and, and doing the best they can um, at all times, so um, without fault, so thank you for that. Um, so we're we happy to move on to item seven. Fabulous, thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Lowney. And that chair slide. Chair, can I just um, ensure that we do note that the homeless piece of the uh, discussion does come to whichever meeting it's coming to, uh, because I think people will see that as a very important uh, piece of information that we haven't discussed in detail this evening. Thank you. Thank you to all our lovely TAC members who are to join us this evening. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we now come on to item seven on the agenda, the general fund budget. Um, before we do that, I I, at the start of the meeting, had the option to nominate a deputy, and I didn't nominate a deputy. Um, I would like to request nominations for a deputy for this evening, as uh, uh, Councillor Lumby isn't around this evening. <coughs> Do I have any nominations? Councillor if, if I may. You're nominating you or you're yeah, nominating I'm nominating else. myself actually, so yes, unless you need to nominate me. Second, 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 thank you. Yes, of course you are. <laughs> so while Councillor Cook moves around, um, we're coming on to the general fund budget, so um, it's report reference um, SC062 and CAB 3335, pages 33 to 68 um, in our agenda pack. So um, the recommendation is that the scrutiny committee comment on the proposals in the attached cabinet report um, to be considered by cabinet on the 17th of February. Um, Councillor Cutler, Mr Botham, who would like to introduce this for us this evening? I'm happy to introduce it, Chair. It's okay. Um, last year we had a very, we had to set a very challenging budget and were forced to take some really hard decisions to reduce overall costs to balance the budget. Um, we forecast that income would drop by 20%. And despite a strong recovery and very high demand in the city centre car parks more recently, we were right to, uh, to do so. We amended the forecast for this year to a 14% reduction in income. So we're finishing our year stronger than we had feared we would, and um, we're able to reduce our call on um, reserves as a result. We still face some significant risks this year. We're pursuing a number of very complex planning enforcement cases uh, which, for which we approved uh, a £200,000 budget back in October to support this. The costs will be higher, and we're currently assessing the potential risk here. Our contractors are also seek seeking greater assistance to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and, and inflation. Uh, we're taking a firm but fair line. We're expecting this to increase costs in coming months. Um, this committee reviewed our budget option proposals back in October and made very few comments at the time. We were then anticipating a three-year settlement um, and the implementation of the government's proposed reset business rates as part of that. Uh, unsurprisingly, yet again, this didn't happen. Um, uh, and um, we now have a, a one-year announcement pushing back the financing review yet another year. Um, while this means we cannot plan effectively as effectively as we hoped, it has meant more positive 2020. 22-23 settlement than we were anticipating, with a further year of new homes bonus at previous levels. This has meant a net one-off ben benefit to the council of 1.3 million. The report before you today confirms the proposals included in the option, October options report. The main change is the number of proposals that we can bring forward as a result of the additional 1.3 million pounds. These are set out in the recommendations and the table in 13.5 of the report and include for the climate emergency 440,000 towards initiatives that contribute to our key council plan priority. Including 250,000 for low carbon transport, 150,000 to prepare for a food waste trial, 
and 40,000 to improve facilities to encourage walking and cycling across the district. We are proposing on, on the environment £185,000 to increase investment to address fly tipping and to respond to the many requests of market towns, the town forum and residents to tidy up our high streets and improve our neighbourhoods. We have um, much needed work to do on monuments and historic assets and um, we propose bringing forward £450,000 worth of the million pounds expenditure that is required um, on our important monuments, assets and open space. The million pounds we had planned over five years, we want to bring this forward. And then very importantly, we want to continue uh, the hardship scheme, the, the additional hardship scheme for council tax and we allocated 100,000 for this. It's important to highlight that we're still forecasting deficits in future years. Our medium term financial strategy includes a proposal to address the forecast deficit in 23-24 from the transitional reserve, but, we also, but also to complete a detailed and thorough strategic budget review to identify how we address longer term deficits. This will include reviewing all operating costs and an ongoing asset challenge to make sure we're using our assets effectively and an assessment of the opportunities to generate additional income from our services. Work starts on this now. I'm not proposing to use the one-off monies to underpin base budgets and with inflation currently running at 5.4%, some increase in charges and council tax is unavoidable. A proposed 2.7% increase in council tax is below that being proposed by many neighbouring authorities and 3% increase in fees agreed in December is again well below current inflation. Despite the long term challenges, I'm pleased to be able to bring forward a budget that maintains all core services, increases capacity for project <coughs> delivery and for some core teams which have seen increased demands in them. It also proposes some really important investment plans that will benefit residents right across the district. Chair, I'm happy to take questions and the finance team are here to assist. Many thanks, Councillor Cutler. So we'll come to the main body of the paper, page 33 to, uh, sorry, 38 to 53. Does anybody have any questions in the main report? Councillor Power. Thank you, Chairman. Um, may I question the logic behind the halving of business rate from 23-24? We've been promised a business rate reset for some years now, um, and I would, would like to know the intelligence that is contributing to that decision to halve it in the budget. Thank you. Chair, yeah, the, um, the, the, the figures in the appendix show that the, um, um, uh, the, le the level of business rates um, that the, the council will build the budget on is based on um, that re retained share. There was an initial allocation based on an assessment of which is as need. We've been able to retain a share of the, the increase in business rates since then, and that's why that's what makes up that five million. Um, the assumption that that ends is based on the government um, saying that the one year announcement is a one year deferral of their firm plans to reset business rates. They have clearly said their intention is to move back to the assessment they have previously made. So that, that's what forms the um, the forecast that uh, that will revert to 2.5 percent, uh, 2.5 million, and you will see increases by inflation after then. So that's that's the broad assumption. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Cutler, for such a fantastic budget in such constrained times. It's amazing to see that we can achieve a balanced budget um, with with these great additions possible. At 13.6, you talk about the historic assets and the works that are going to be completed on those. Just wondered if you could explain why it's considered necessary to do them. Now, obviously, I'm very grateful for it, but I know there are members who have questions about why it's being brought forward. So, As, as, as part of our asset management, we know that the, the, the assets 
and the historic monuments need a, a million pounds sterling on them over five years. We felt that this was an opportunity, particularly a sort of post-pandemic and a jubilee year, to bring forward some of that work while we had the funds to do it. Uh, uh, and uh, I've been assured that we can spend money in this year. Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, we had quite a lot of discussion about whether it was possible, um, whether it will be within the 12 month period is, is you know, sort of, there are obviously lots of reasons, particularly some of the things require natural England, uh, but not natural England, historic England's so permission. Um, so yes, there are many a uh, slip, I suppose, on, on, on the way, but we, 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 we are quite confident that we can spend the majority of that and, and um, improve the environment in the city. Uh, you know, one aspect of it, of course, is that our historic monuments are mainly that we hold responsibility for, are mainly in the city. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Becker participated in my question. Um, it, it, it is my question in terms of a, a million over the next five years suggests 200,000 a year and bringing forward 450. It's a, it's a big bring forward. Um, I do note on page 57, later in appendix, it actually refers to half a million being spent. So there's a discrepancy between where the 1.3 is going to be spent uh, on page 47 and page 48. Uh, 57 and 48, so I'm probably worth a look at. Um, when we've tried to get the butt across cleaned, we've just been told all we can do is spray it with distilled water. Um, we've been doing that for two years. I think if we're going to spend this much money, we need to have a robust plan in place because otherwise it's, it, it doesn't have any credibility. Thank you. Well, thank you for picking up the deliberate mistake where um, we had an adjustment for figures in Appendix B from an, an initial proposal. Um, we had reduced it from an initial proposal of half a million to 450,000 uh, and redistributed about 50,000 um, within within that spend. Um, in terms of the detail, I think Richard possibly is a little more uh, au fait with the, the answers on, on how, on the how. Chair, yeah, certainly we, we, we are we're projecting the need to spend a million pounds. We don't have a million pounds, so that's the key reason for uh, that, that, that makes this a positive proposal for, for the budget. So we, we we knew that there's a call on our asset reserve um, from our monuments over the next five years. Um, the butter cross is in need of repair, not just cleaning. There is a repair that we're in discussions with Historic England about how, how we bring that forward. St Morris's Tower is in need of urgent repair. So there are works there that we feel we, know we ought to be getting on with. We didn't have the funds set aside for them. So this is an opportunity to bring forward that, that, that work. What it does do also is it frees up the monies in the asset reserve for investing in other assets as we move forward. So at the moment, we're preparing an asset strategy that we'll bring forward in, 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 in the coming months. That will, um, that will identify um, a need to invest in assets that's probably more than we have in the reserve at the moment. So we do need to build that reserve up. So this is this contribute helps to contribute towards that. Brings forward some really some really important work at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Botham. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, could I just understand why we're spending a quarter of a million on um, <clears throat> uh, bin lorries and buses when we know absolutely that we need um, uh, low carbon uh, uh, transport uh, resources for both our waste disposal and for the buses, but we. The, these types of vehicles are operating in other parts of the country already with other authorities. Um, we have um, commercial organisations delivering the services around buses and the like. So why are we having to pick up the trial? What are we going to learn um, that we don't already know from fellow authorities or indeed the providers themselves um, who um, have, uh, have these services? And I'm then looking to to pitch. So I'm not sure what what, what our 
what our investment is needed for. Chair, thank you. Councillor Cutler, is that one for you? Well, the reality is that um, in investing in, in that infrastructure in terms of both, you know, can't introduce electric vehicles without, without charging. We need to understand the capacities required um, and, and some of that initial work so that, so that they can be trialed. We can't, we can't go straight into it because it'll take time, time to build. We won't be expecting our uh, contractors to provide the charging points and, and that side of things. So that infrastructure will have, will have to come about it. And this is part of the preparatory work on, on that. But Mr. Bertrand may want to add some more to that. Chair, I was going to comment on the um, the, um, the issue around capacity. We know, we know there is a, a an issue with electric electricity capacity in, in the city. So so the way we operate here will be different than the way some other districts do. We also have the issue around rural collection using using bin, electric bin lorries for rural collection. That, that, that that's another challenge that we um, we haven't seen good evidence of elsewhere. So that's um, an opportunity. Um, but as far as the actual specifics around the proposal, I, I, I haven't got the full detail, but uh, um, when, when I come to the Todd, you, you had anything that you, you could supplement and on, on what that proposal might be if you didn't. That's okay. Chair, can I just ask in response to Mr Botham's comment? I mean, we know that we've had shortages or outages, shall I say, here in the city in terms of the uh, infrastructure, but that's again not our call, yeah. that's obviously Southern Electrics. Will this relate, work with them as well then to ensure that we've got the appropriate power capacity to do what we need to do? Uh, I'll defer to Council for going to be closer to, to, to this tonight. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, there are a wide range of issues that need to be addressed. So, for example, um, it's not clear that there's enough capacity at the uh, at the stagecoach bar and depot to support electric charging in the current forms, and we've had some analysis done by Atkins that said we may need to be repurposing part of uh, one of the park and ride car parks in, in order to, to support electric charging. So there are interested, there are important questions about um, particularly the charging infrastructure, which need to be addressed and may well incur costs on our part. Um, Almost nowhere, as far as I'm aware, are the uh, bus companies paying for the installation um, of the electric charging infrastructure. And also, the buses themselves cost considerably more. Um, uh, and uh, part of what we'll be looking for is to make sure that when it comes to things like zebra bids to government for full scale electrification of places like uh, Winchester, that we are ready to do that. And, and um, the, the, we have the case, we have the experience, and we're able to go to government and show that we're serious and we know what it involves in order to make that kind of proposal. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Moore? Thank you. Councillor Goodfrey. <coughs> um, thank you. I, I wonder if Councillor Cutler could um, talk a bit more about the strategic budget review. Um, uh, it announced in October um, uh, and cabinets as part of the uh, uh, medium term financial strategy. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if by now um, uh, he has a sense of a range of um, uh, financial uh, changes that um, uh, he hopes to achieve by this review by uh, either savings or increased income to be achieved um, and delivered by this review. Um, and uh, uh, when he expects uh, that review to be finished by, um, and, and perhaps when it started. The review has not started yet. Um, <coughs> when you get a spending review announcement just before Christmas, and most of the work is on this budget because we, we are not given enough notice by government. Um, but the intention is as soon as um, as soon as we've passed this budget at next week's council, we will start the process. So therefore, I can't give you any indication other than the range of we will look, be looking at all costs, all potential um, sources of income and, and all areas of efficiency and we will take you know we, we have time I think that's 
the key thing. It, it, our our medium-term financial strategy shows that we have next year a virtually balanced buzz, budget from with, with the transition reserve. We, we will be in a strong position, but it also shows a, a sort of structural deficit of two two million um, pounds a year or so, and, and that's what we seek to achieve. But I can't at the moment. You know, obviously it will be a uh, a lengthy process looking at all the options and there will be some hard choices. But we do know that at the same time we, we were, we're looking at uh, agile working within the council, there will be efficiencies there. Um, there, are, there are a whole range of, of, of what we need to look at. Um, so we would hope to be bringing forward proposals um, by, by the autumn. For, for next year's budget. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, with regard to the increases that are being uh, been approved with reference to the sports and leisure park and Meadowside, it says the charges of 3% for the sessions. Well, exactly what effect does that have for the Winchester City Council? How much money will they get from that? Obviously, we've got the operator, so increasing certain sessions at such an early stage, what, what do we get from that? Thank you. I will have to pass that over, I'm, I'm afraid, in terms of the detail. I, I, the reason that those leisure centre charges were come to this paper rather than when the fees and charges were done was because it was a discussion with the operators mm -hmm. and, and presume. Um, and that's part of the contract, so that had to be done in January. And they've chosen to put up some charges by three percent, and and you know we've agreed that. But others that, that remain the same. So the average isn't as high as three percent. But I'm not sure of the detail of how that affects our income from the leisure centres. Uh, Richard, Chair, probably those, those proposals seek to maintain the business plan for the for, for, for the centre. So. I wouldn't see that, that those decisions themselves in, <coughs> increasing overall income. They're about keeping pace with increasing costs, inflation, utilities, and that sort of. Uh, we have had discussions about whether they, they needed to be higher because of current inflation levels, um, but the operator themselves are recommending three percent, which would you know, so that's why we included that. I think. Councillor Hall. Chair, one we had a, um, a sports and leisure park. Um, board meeting this afternoon and the budget did come up um, in the sense of a review of the budget given such a significant project for the council and ensuring that um, we understand all the assumptions we made were they correct um, how are we doing against that and are we able to make it work effectively and you know are we able to reinvest in the facility to make it even bigger and better than we anticipated um, or uh, review that and I just wondered where that process will come um, building on the, the, the fees and charges discussion which I accept is still early days we're still in the pressure <coughs> of operating but where that budget discussion will come for such a, an important new facility for us it, it may be something that um, um, officers are looking at but I'm, I'm not aware of that thank you Chair, the, the medium term financial strategy um, uh, assumes the income that, that was set out in the in the business plan for the centre. So, so the the income that uh, is being generated by uh, by the, the current operator um, is it, it broadly pays for the operating of the centre. So that's the the, the, the base position. Um, we have the report does include commentary around there being a better than oper a better operating position this year, which is good positive. Uh, the operator is currently saying that that is not set to continue. We are, we're in discussions about that, and um, what there is in the uh, arrangement, though, is is, a, is, a, is an open book arrangement with 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 a, with a share above certain levels. So, uh, and Catherine Horace is exactly right that we, as, a, as an organisation, we need to review that, monitor that, review that, assess how that's going over time, um, and take every opportunity we 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 can to to, to benefit from that from that share agreement. That's that part of that post. Exactly how we bring that forward back to the to, um, to members, whether that's through the advisory board or whether that's through through this committee, I think is yet to be determined. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Councillor Christ. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions, if I may, on 13.6 and the spend of this bonus that's come through. Um, the council tax support item number one. Um, so we've got 100,000 for additional funding to continue the hardship grant provision. What was spent previously in terms of the hardship grant, and is that enough money? I think I need to remind you that there is an we have an excellent council tax reduction scheme which was Councillor Godfrey's um, baby some years ago. We, we, we needed to modify it last year because of um, uh, the change to universal credit, but, but that scheme works well. That is a, a scheme that has to be agreed with all the preceptors because any reduction we make in, in, in council tax um, to, to, to um, the claimants is shared equally. County Council um, well, is shared on the on the proportion that, that we collect the, uh, the the council tax for those. This this we introduced an additional hardship scheme last year because of COVID, um, which is a is a top up to the other scheme which we pay for ourselves. And um, I can't recall the actual figure <coughs> that we, we put into the scheme last year, but we're assured, given the take up that we had um, by revenue and benefits, that, that 100,000 will be sufficient for an adequate scheme, because it is a top up, as I say, for, to, the, to the council tax reduction scheme. I think 50% of it goes as a, as a direct top up, and 50% and, and is for those that for some reason fall outside the council tax reduction scheme. So we're, we're assured that that will be sufficient under these circumstances. We felt it was important because we know that, that um, there will be some considerable pressures on, on, on parts of the population this, this um, next few months in particular. Thank you, Councillor Cutler. Mr. Bosom. Okay, just, just, um, just add a slight supplementary to that. Uh, assured with, within the limits of what we know at the moment, of course, what could what we could be facing over the course of the next year um, is, is 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 difficult to predict. And so, if demand on that scheme remains broadly similar to the to, to the previous year, that, that that provision will be more than adequate. If it uh, if it significantly increases within the terms of the scheme set out in the appendix, then that scheme will, then that then that um, though that money will be used up more quickly and we may we have the ability to come back and ask um, for uh, members to consider topping top that fund up. But we think that that's that's a, a reasonable provision based on our experience of COVID and the last year. Sorry Joe, just a couple of questions on this uh, 13.6. Um, I, I fully understand what we're trying to do in terms of distributing the bonus across the pie and making sure that it's fairly allocated and appropriate allocated. I think with that in mind, in terms of some of these other items, maybe the climate and emergency transport, promoting cycling walking, street scene, is there anything that could be covered under SIL funding perhaps? Because I know we have a lot of SIL funding that we have in restricted reserves. Is there anything we could use to offset or in, in, in some of these areas perhaps? We can't make proposals for spending SIL money in our general fund um, budget. Um, but, but in a way, it's a separate question. So um, we're, we're proposing within this budget, we can spend this on that. Um, the question that whether some of those areas could be topped up with SIL, I think, is, is, is in a way a separate debate. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, the increase in staffing budget for 175,000 to create additional capacity for legal, comms and economic development. Um, please could um, uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Cutler or Mr. Botham just confirm 
uh, the num specific number of heads allocated to each of those um, uh, uh, departments, but also to question. Um, we're often told um, uh, work is slowed down because we don't have the appropriate legal resource, particularly in enforcement, which was mentioned this evening. We have some very significant cases um, and we can't progress very often because we don't have the due legal resource to review all the papers before they can progress. So I'm just questioning, one, what is the balance of heads across those various areas? And two, um, whether we're assured that the legal requirements that we obviously have to, um, uh, that we require to deliver in other parts of our duties, whether we have sufficient resources to support those other functions given the delays that we're advised of at the moment. Thank you. Well, the, the, one of the very first points I raised, and it's in uh, point uh, 12.4, we, we added in here, we haven't put a figure on it, it, it is for additional resource, which we'll probably need to go externally for, um, for particularly two significant um, major sites. And, and that will be a considerable cost. Uh, and we recognise that we will need to set that. Uh, and that will be over and above what we've already put in. So what we're recognising is we put additional resource in legal that's not including that, the, the, those major sites, um, because we recognise that that is probably one of the key areas that our residents are concerned about on enforcement. We've had the discussion uh, at several levels um, and um, you know, I'm keen that we, we make sure the resources are there. The, the exact split on the staffing, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, Richard uh, will, but I know most of it, it's legal is the biggest portion of it. Um, okay. It doesn't actually equate to exact numbers of headcount, but broadly it's two posts in the legal team and one, and one each of the other two, and a further post in the strategic planning team, which already exists. It's a case of making a fixed term post permanent in the strategic planning team. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ferguson. <clears throat> um, thank you, Chair. Um, when, when I look at this paper, I, mean, I actually think it's quite phenomenal um, that we've managed to bring forward not only a balanced budget, but a budget which um, allows us to do some very important things, important work that needs to be done going forward. Um, and what I can say is that given we've been through such turbulent financial period with the um, pandemic, I, I just need to thank officers for work that done. I congratulate a cabinet member. Um, the question I have is on 13.6.2 around the public consultation. Um, I know that we only had 32 responses. Um, I know they were broadly um, in agreement with proposals being put forward. Um, I just wondered why why so few? <laughs> um, I would think, given the significance of this paper and the impact it could have on residents' lives, that there would have been more interest um, in this. I want to hear more comment. Thank you. Um, I think the numbers didn't, didn't, didn't surprise me. We do speak to representative bodies like the parish councils, the bid, and and, uh, and, and and business strategy, uh, the local business strategy groups, um, and, and build a picture there. Um, responses to our um, budget surveys in recent years have seen slightly more than that, but normally when we're making bigger proposals. So, of course, the consultation followed the October um, options paper which was a broadly neutral way, but the difference here, of course, is the spending review brought additional monies forward that weren't included in the consultation. So if that consultation had been how we spent 1.3 million, that people may have had more of an interest in that. Um, but broadly, there was support for increasing fees in our inflation um, for, and, um, and, 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 the, and the general proposals that were set out in, in, in that option, in that option paper. But, but, but not a lot in there, I suppose, to get people that excited, I suppose. And uh, with the strategic budget review, it will be critical that we uh, consult widely on that because that will be big options. And I think that's when we'll go back to reintroduce it. We've used the budget simulator before where we've asked people to make some choices around investment decisions. 
and, and that's really what generates the public interest, I think, when we can get that. But that will form a key part of that process. Yeah, I'd just like to echo that because I do recall the scrutiny meeting uh, on the budget options paper being accused of presenting a very boring paper, and partly because um, there wasn't much flexibility and there wasn't much change. Um, and the real frustration is that government spending announcements just get later and later. And it, you know, for three years I've been doing this. You know, we've been promised a settlement and an understanding of that settlement relatively early, and it's not come. We've been told it will be a three-year settlement, and it's not come. It's rolled over. And at the last minute, you know, I think it was the week before Christmas, we got the detail on this, which you know was welcome. I can't complain about the outcome of it, but it does make <coughs> consulting difficult, consultation dif difficult, it makes planning <coughs> difficult, and, and um, so there is a, there's a frustration there. I think it is very likely that this year, with the levelling up agenda, uh, there is a lot of pressure for there to be that longer term settlement, and we, we've, we're assuming that longer term settlement, and we're assuming it based on the figures we've had before, they could be worse, and that is one of the risks that we have. We're assuming a level of damping on, on you know, business rates reset, but then some uh, funding to smooth the transition. Um, that may, we can't be absolutely sure that will happen. Um, so we're, we're, we're working on, on, on the information we've been given, the indications we've had, but given where we are and the um, the declared intention to move funding north, uh, you know, there is a concern that we might not be um, quite as well off as even we've assumed. Thank you, Councillor Cutler. So, did you just to just um, by way of supplementary to my previous response, um, whilst it won't be in in time to support the decision on this on this budget, we have included a, 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 um, um, uh, a series of budget questions in, in the uh, resident survey that is going on. So that, that's going out as a, a proper um, a structured survey that uh, is being completed. Uh, it's being exactly being undertaken now. So uh, that's the news on the doorstep. So that's that's um, it will give us a, a good base of information on which to start moving to feed into the strategic review process. And as you know, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully be forward far more than 35 responses. To them. <laughs> Councillor Weir. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions, but just a quick one on Council, uh, the hardship fund, and then around the, the, the more strategic issue at, at sort of point 14, uh, point 4. Um, on the hardship fund, what are we doing to ensure that people who are eligible uh, know about it and can take advantage of it and um, contribute to uh, local basics bank and obviously some some of the agencies we work with are in the front line there uh, are they fully engaged with us in helping to ensure that, that people who really need it are able to take advantage of that and I can quick think move on to the main question so, I do think further up the team. Obviously, I think the team will, will be mindful of about not consulting too widely until they know it's been, been agreed by, by council that the, the scheme is uh, is confirmed. Obviously, that's quite part of it. Um, but that, that that will need to be part of it. But I need to check that with Mrs. Hall, Mrs. Horner and the revenue's team and confirm what arrangement she's putting in place. Now. Would you be able to confirm that back to us? Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Um My second question, sort of. Uh, kind of covers this and in, in into the appendix, but it, it does really refer to that point 14.4. Um, and again, the colleagues, I, I congratulate the portfolio holder and the team for bringing forward a, a balanced budget with only you know a, a 2.7 percent proposal for council tax rise. But as as the portfolio <coughs> holder alluded to, um, inflation rates at the moment are double that. Um, and I'm not seeing that higher inflation rate built into any of our figures on, on the general revenue fund. So it does 
uh, make this sort of strategic review of, of funding come forward even more important. <coughs> but maybe you'd like to say something around, you know, how effective some of the the uh, char service charging has been in helping us to to manage our, our budgets and, and arrive at balanced budgets. And uh, if there's any thinking around that in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think by the, you know, as we're developing the service review, it will become clearer of where the, you know, what the effects of inflation will be, because <coughs> uh, nearly all the predictions in the early stages, um, when it was recognised that inflation would increase through, uh, through this year, have suggested that it will be a very short term. There is now beginning to be a slightly different view. Uh, it's not a consensus, I would say, but there is a there is a view among some some commentators that that um, inflation would be sort of start a, a cycle that means that it doesn't bounce back, um, and uh, that obviously would be a concern and completely change the, the predictions over time. But at the moment, we have to make certain assumptions when we're building this. We put 4% in for contractual inflation for this year and 3% next year. That may not be enough. We've also put a seven, we've also reduced our estimate on the fall in income. Last year we, we went 20% for this year, 10% for the fall, you know, for the year we're now budgeting and five. Because it's come out at 14. We felt that we could reduce that estimate of lost income to seven. Now, there'll be some flexibility there, which may or may not counterbalance the, the inflation element of things. So, you know, there have to be assumptions in there, whether they're the right ones. Um, perhaps that's the part of the debate um, we, we have here. We've chosen these at the moment. On, on the information we had. Thank you, Councillor Wayne, for that question. Um, Councillor Hall. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in 13.5a, um, we hear that our very good tenants, the law courts, are leaving. Um, they've uh, obviously caught up. Um, but that is now going to reduce our income um, by 175,000 as we return to um, our own management of the Guild Hall. Um, and we know the Guild Hall can be a huge drain uh, for us as an organisation. Uh, what measures are in place to ensure that that continues for a very short time um, and that we uh, find another route forward for this uh, building? Yeah, we have, we have commissioned um, an, an agency to uh, do some market research for us on, on options for the operation of, of the building. Um, they have been talking to the events sector uh, about what the potential interest could be for a building such as this. Um, and the, whilst they there was an initial head, headline projections themselves, that hasn't been supported by, by the market at the moment. So the market is depressed, the, the events market is depressed, obviously is recovering slowly, and a number of those who expressed an interest in, 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 in dialogue have said, come talk to us again in six months. <coughs> um, and so we, that's exactly what we'll be doing. We will be continuing that work with that, with that agency um, and bringing forward proposals, you know, whether, whether that's part of the, the, the strategic review or whether the work is happening anyway, that's a piece of work being led through by our estate team. Um, so we will be bringing forward proposals back to for member, members to consider the future, the longer term future of the building. In the meantime, the uh, the operational team here will operate it as an events uh, um, uh, facility. We'll, we're, we're in the process of marketing. We've spoken to previous hirers. There's a lot of interest already in in, uh, in people wanting to come come back and make make use of the building. So we'll make the best use of it we can. We, we are not proposing to re-establish uh, the, the sort of major resource that we invested and could never recover our costs previously. We're operating it very much as a, as a turnkey operation effectively. So um, we already have one, you know, at least one, but we are interested in more of major conference bookings 
uh, where they're coming, the, the, the operator will come in and run the event themselves. We facilitate it effectively. Um, and we'll be doing our best to make sure we, we maximise those opportunities in the short term. But that's a short term solution. Whilst we work out that, that longer term options, and we'll come back to them as well when we've got more information. Thank you, Mr. Bertham. Thank you for the question. Um, Councillor Crest. Thank you, Chair. Again, on 13.6, I'm afraid. Um, and I recognise everything that's been said around the difficulty of working through local government budgets at this time and with the increasingly reduced funding over periods and the lack of transparency around that. Um, but that said, in terms of has there been any thought about spending some of that money on the HRA to compensate for the, for the loss of... No, that's not something we can do? Well, they are two completely separate accounts. We do not transfer money from the HRA to the general. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, and the food waste trial, um, is that essential? Because, I mean, looking at all these bonus items, these are things we presumably cut cloth accordingly and not and found we've not needed. Um, so I'm really looking for justification for these. So the food waste trial, is that something we need to do this year? We, we need to prepare for the fact that um, it will be mandatory for us to have a free food waste collection in probably 2025. It's been our aspiration as an administration to bring that forward. Um, if possible. We know, and Councillor Todd can give us <clears throat> a lot more detail about it if we want, um, uh, that you know, with the implementation of the Environment Bill, um, there'll be a major change in, that, in, in the whole process of, of, of waste collection and we should be able to increase our recycling rates and, and all that sort of thing. From a climate change point of view, food waste is really important. From a decarbonisation point of view, it's, it's really important. Two adjacent local authorities are already <laughs> have implemented a food, food waste collection. Uh, we intend to look closely at whether we can trial it so that when the time comes, we can implement it properly and well. Because, you know, it's going to be a big bang when the time comes with the other forms of waste, it would be very good to get ahead of the game on food waste. So this is a level of funding to explore the possibility of implementing a food waste trial probably in April next year in perhaps part of the district. Once again, you know, we'll be straight about this, having the information at the beginning of December or at the end of December on this on this surplus fund, we have a very short time to work up plans on this, and we think this is a reasonable figure to put in to develop the food waste process, the food waste collection process. Um, and that, that really is it sums it up. Councillor Goodfrey. Can I just clarify you you said about reply that um, this trial will start in uh, perhaps April 23. So why do you need to spend £150,000 this year? There will be some preparation. As I said, it's, it's quite difficult to budget in, in short term on a process like that, but I couldn't necessarily guarantee that, you know, we talked about it on, on the um, uh, monuments that, that we would hope that we'd get things moving within that time, but, but actually budgeting of what the cost of that preparation for the food waste trial is quite difficult at the moment. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, thank you. The new homes bonus has been obviously a very positive addition that we haven't anticipated. And so in 13.6, we have some really interesting projects and, and activities that we've put forward. And I'm sure all of us have a favourite here, which um, we think might be more sensible than, than others. And 
um, elements like the hardship grant increase are all, I think, really important. However, you said earlier this evening that you've had to, um, obviously, in the prior budget, to take some hard <coughs> decisions. And so my question is, um, and slightly builds on what Council Christ was trying to get to, do we need to put some of this money back into the basic <coughs> running of the council <coughs> and activities? We're looking to put some staff back in in certain areas uh, that have been impacted um, over the recent past rather than necessarily a special new project um, testing um, elements for the future. I accept you might want to get prepared, but actually next year might be the year to actually go back and re-establish some of the um, areas that have been, um, had to, to be, um, uh, uh, have reduced resources um, uh, recently. Um, and there's not a, there's a considerable sum of money here. So have you, have you, can you assure us all that the day-to-day -day workings are in good order and all of this, which is rather the icing on the cake, um, is um, appropriate um, at this time? Thank you. Well, I think there's, there's the question of, of regarding before the spending review um, or the spending announcement, um, we created a balance budget, managed to re-establish um, some of the areas that, that the pandemic necessarily had you know, forced us into difficult decisions. To create a balanced budget, we had a better than expected out or forecast a better than expected outturn, which which put some reserves back. We we um, put funding back into long-term uh, or permanent um, staffing positions that are different than the ones that we took out because we did take decisions at the time of the sport team, the, the guild hall team. We're not proposing to put those back, we agree, but we have put extra resources into economic recovery uh, legal as, as, as we talked about. But the reality is that that 1.3 million is one off. Now, we could look at it and say, well, we'll spread it over five years, and then does it do a lot of good for any of our long-term um, uh, work? It's not a big sum then. Uh, whereas I think we felt that because it is a one-off, we know that next year we will have that reduction ongoing. It's the same reason as why um, it would be difficult to justify uh, saying, well, we won't put up council tax this year because that's used up within a few years it's by simply not doing that. Um, so it's a one off expenditure. As part of um, pandemic recovery, as part of a Jubilee year, we've had those requests. When we talked um, to all the market towns, for example, um, about what we could do as a council for economic recovery. The, th the big thing was clean, clean the place up, paint the bins. Um, and I strongly believe that actually this, this, this is quite important for morale to do this. We have a one-off chance to do it, and I think it's very important to do that. So you made the point, everybody would have a slightly different wish, wish list. We've, discussed it widely and this is the approach we wish to take. Do we have any further questions on the main body of the reports at this stage before we go to the bill discussions? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Just really to follow up, and, and, and I think it came out when we were talking about the historic monuments. I think Mr. Bolton said um, that some of this work we knew needed to be done, we just didn't have the money to do it. He made the point about it being important to do it this year, particularly with the Jubilee when the spotlight will be on, um, on the city, on the towns, etc. Um, I just wondered, with some of that work for the high street, which I totally support, um, I certainly know that's the message that I get regularly, um, again, is it that we knew that work was needed, we just didn't have the money to do it, and this has given us the opportunity to get that work done? 
So it's not an icing on the cake, it's something, it's stuff that we know we needed to do. Thank you. Well, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Burton pointed out, we have an asset reserve. We've been able to replenish the asset reserve to a certain extent where we, we reduced contribution to it as part of that sort of pandemic response to the emergency budget last, the, the year before last. That money would have to come from that asset reserve if it became absolutely necessary. And it's a matter of prioritisation. Uh, you know, we also know that our council assets, broader assets, commercial assets, need money spending. From a climate change point of view, they need money spending. We need to up the standards of the office space here. Um, circumstances, you know, have obviously changed about um, what what the requirements are. Um, and so, yes, we could find the money for the monuments going forward from another source, but it would be at the expense of um, the asset management strategy, which we, you know, we all, I think we all agree uh, on both sides here. Um, it's very important to um, improve, improve both the quality and the return from our assets. So it, 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 it's, it's a choice there. So we have the opportunity this time to, 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 to get on with the improving the assets, the, the monuments. I can't promise that we'll get it done by the time of the Jubilee. I mean, that's the difficult bit. <laughs> but, you know, by the end of the year, we should be, we should be showing some, some signs of the work being done. Councillor Cutler, you have um, about three or four months, and yeah. uh, you are That's why I said I'm not. <laughs> 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 Off you go with squirting water bottles, fun, um, so we, might get, we might get the King Alfred statue waxed um, in, in, in time. Councillor Crasley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I think one of the, the biggest questions, the biggest issues I have on the doorstep is the cost of living crisis. I think page 50 refers to that. You know, national insurance contributions are going up, employee contributions are going up. Um, we've also got to pay through council tax, it seems, for the employer national insurance contributions for council workers. It seems that there's 116 being added to the general fund cost uh, per year, if, if I'm reading that right, which Kind of puts the bonus somewhat into perspective in terms of there are other, are other costs coming through um, and maybe that was factored in already which is fine um, i guess that's the question is that factored in um, but that's where that's where my questions are coming from is this cost of living crunch people are you know seeing national insurance go up they're seeing the tax thresholds limited so more people are being pushed into higher rates tax bans and into paying tax in the first place um, we've got a handout from the government in terms of a council tax payment and i've got questions around how is that do we, do we know how that's being administered is that something that we're administering is there a, a cost for administering that um, so those, so the, those two questions is, so to national insurance contributions, is that a new cost? Um, and at a time when the government is giving a handout for council tax, do we know how it's going to be handled? Thank you. In terms of national insurance contribution, that is factored into, into the budget um, as part, part of the um, increased staff costs, which which is in, in, in Appendix A. Um, in terms of the uh, band A to D, £150, we will be administering that. What I'm not sure, clear on is whether we actually get some funding for the cost of administration of that. I think it's yet another thing that the Revenue and Benefits team will be saying, you know, sort of, oh, holding their head in horror, but they've, met, they've done a wonderful job in the last year putting out £52 million worth of grants to um, um, business 
the, the, and, uh, and implementing a series of different schemes very, very quickly. And I'm sure they'll cope with this one, but I'm, I'm not sure if we do get any uh, what's known as new burdens funding for that additional work. Um, Mr. Botham may have some more information on that. Uh, I have a chairman. I, I, I can confirm that. And I'll check, check and confirm that to the committee. Um, as, as, yeah, I mean, as far as that, that is a, 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 another unforeseen impact on our revenue stream, very positive impact for our residents, obviously. Um, and they are in the process of implementing that as, as we speak. It does mean we are um, having to make that payment separate to the council tax. We can't just give it a, a reduction on council tax, which is unfortunate in for, for, them, for them. That would have been a much simpler process. Um, so it's a, a separate payment. So we are having to do some work on gathering bank details and, and, and that sort of thing. So those, those sort of things don't come, don't come easy, but the team are well, are well advanced in their, their preparation. Thank you. Okay, now moving on to Appendix A. Um, Appendix A is the Let's go to Appendix B on page 57. Any specific questions on Appendix B? That's Rebecca. Just to confirm that that will be updated to reflect the numbers in the paper. Yes, certainly. Uh, it was uh, an oversight and not, 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 not changing those. It, it, it fundamentally is 50,000 off the monuments, 15 added to the um, Motion cycling and walking and 35 added to the flight of the street scene. Um, so that that the numbers. I've made a note of that as well for the final points in this paper. Okay, I'm going on to Appendix C. Any specific questions on Appendix C? No. Appendix D then, please. No, if you want to sorry, sorry. Oh, Councillor Powell. Um, Chairman, I think we agreed at the previous meeting that staff costs would be shown on the town account. Um, this was to reassure the parishes that um, the town was not getting um, staff costs for free and to demonstrate the case. That doesn't seem to be reflected here. Absolutely, Councillor Powell. I recall that now you mentioned it. Thank you for bringing that up. Would that be able to be added? Sure, we wouldn't add it to the the the, the, the except this is a summary of service costs, so that's the reason that it's set out on this basis. But we can certainly share with all members what the, the, the staffing impact and the staffing recharge to to just included within these figures. We can clarify that detail. Um, and um, I, I think I can speak to Mr. Kennedy about that today. He's updating those figures, for, and I can share those with them. I, I think, Chairman, that it would be better. I, I understand that the staffing costs are included in the, these individual lines. I think if we are looking at reassuring the parishes that the town forum does not get staff for free at a cost to the entire residents of Winchester, it should be shown as a separate line. And I understand that the overall totals will not change. Um, but I would strongly recommend that it is a separate line, Chairman. We, we, we can look at the best way to report that, but I mean, I can confirm that the, the impact of, the, of, of staff on the town account is in excess of £300,000. Um, so there is a significant reach on going back through that account, but, but we can confirm those details. Thank you, Mr. Bateson. Thank you, Councillor Powell, for that question. Um, and coming on to Appendix C, which is sideways and the wrong way round. Does anybody have any questions on that, if you can see it? <laughs> No. Okay. And Appendix F, finally. Any questions specifically on Appendix F? No. Okay. Do we have any debates on this paper then, please? Councillor Weir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I'd just like to welcome uh, this, what I think is a well calibrated budget. Uh, in very turbulent times, um, and I, I think that uh, the, the whole finance team and Councillor Kavanagh should be um, <coughs> rewarded for what they continue to do. 
Um, we, we're facing a lot of uncertainty as a result of government uh, delays, the impact of astronomical fuel cost rises, and an ongoing Brexit chaos, which uh, could be with us all of it for years to come. So it's really important, I think, that we get the baseline operations sustainably funded uh, before uh, the next fuel uh, spending review comes forward. And, and I really do think that it's right that we use the one-off funding for drive, helping us drive some of the transformation that we're going to need to make um, uh, and that we can then realise savings and efficiencies in future years when the impact of the finance review eventually kicks in. So congratulations, I think this is a really uh, good start. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Craske. Thank you, Joe. I've said a lot on this, but I just wanted to give some context in terms of I want to thank the team, the officers, and the cabinet lead for the fantastic work that's been done managing the budget within this pandemic and within the the changes that keep coming through from government is a fantastic achievement. Um, but it's there's more that's now required with this bonus that's come through, with the cost of living crunch that people have, um, with the focus on council tax, particularly with this handout that's been given from government, which will be seen as as support to those that need it. Just want to make sure that we have considered, given the limited opportunity we have for consultation, the right way to spend the money, um, and that we, we're challenging ourselves in how we are spending that money, whether there's alternatives through SIL funding or such like, um, and that we've got the right allocation. Um, I like the comment around, you know, a good part of this is about supporting transformation to deliver efficiencies and cost savings further, further down the line. I think explanation of that type helps defend a lot of this. But I think, as I say, building on the excellent work that's been done, it's now about delivering on this transformational work, this improvement work, to make sure we actually do spend this money and spend it well and spend it in the time frame and get the returns on it that we will hope to achieve. So thank you. Do we have any further debate? Councillor Ferguson? Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> add to the comments that uh, Councillor Craske and Councillor Weir had made. Um, and I was delighted to see that within the additional funds that become available, the first thought um, was to increase the funding for the Council's Hardship Fund, showing that we really do have a focus on our communities and those who are perhaps um, suffering the most uh, with the cost of living crisis. Um, I also wanted to highlight something that we haven't spoken about, which is the um, £25,000 um, support for the Council's pledge for towards the City of Sanctuary. Um, I think that's really important money that's been spent while there. There was cross-party overwhelming support for that. Um, and in general, we've focused on the windfall money. But the other thing I want to highlight is I'm delighted to see a continued provision um, of additional funds for the climate emergency work, which again is going to be really important going forward, um, <clears throat> not only to address our carbon neutrality ambitions, but again for that transformational work. So congratulations to officers and particularly to um, portfolio holder Councillor Cutler. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Right, so if I come back to the recommendation that we comment on the proposals attached and we've answered, we've asked many questions, had a few thoughts on this. Um, so on this particular paper, um, we've put in to correct the discrepancy between page 47 and appendix B, confirmation of how the hardship fund will be promoted to those who need it and share with members starting costs for WTF shown as a separate line perhaps for consideration. Are there any other points you feel I've missed? No. Okay, so if everybody's happy, we will then move on to item eight. Councillor Ferguson? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Chair, do you think we could have a few minutes comfort break? We to I've already this? said we're going to have 10 minutes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But we're happy to move on, are we? Yes, yeah. agreed, right. 
Um, if we can come back, please, at 10 to 9, that would be appreciated. Thank you.
welcome back. Hope you had a nice leg stretch. So we're now on to item eight of the capital investment strategy. Pages 69 to 112, report reference SC061 and CAB 3332. Again, the recommendation is that we comment on the proposals um, before it goes to Canada on the 17th of February. So, Councillor Cutler or Mr. Botham, who this time? Uh, thank you, Chair. I will introduce the paper. Um, this report sets out the Council's capital spending program and the principles which underpin it in order to deliver the desired outcomes as set out in the Council plan. It details the overall program for the next 10 years, how it's financed, the governance around it, the appetite for risk, and the impact on the Council's medium term financial strategy. The capital program totals for. £417.3 million over the next 10 years, of which £60.7 million is in general fund and £356.6 million for the HRA. Appendix A provides the capital programme by project divided into approved for spend and subject to appraisal. Key changes to this programme are also sum summarised in the report. Uh, the strategy sets out the approval process and project program management protocols in uh, 1.11.6. It also includes several prudential indicators as required by the SIPFA Prudential Code for Capital Finance, and also the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities the Statutory Investment Guidance, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's included in the body of the report and in Appendix F. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Councillor Cutler. So again, we're going to start off with the main paper, pages 71 to 94. Does anybody have questions about pages 71 to 94 of our agenda packs? No questions? Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, Chair. I had a question on um, 2.7, uh, which is the um, strategic asset purchase scheme. <clears throat> um, I just wondered, when this scheme was originally set up, I think back in 2016, um, there were a lot of assumptions made about um, the return that there would be on the assets purchased under this scheme. And I wondered to what extent the scheme had actually um, met those ambitious um, return targets. Um, and whether or not there was a need to review the scheme to see whether it was still fit for purpose. Thank you. I can't give you the, the, the figures for returns at the moment. We did look at this, I think, around about 18 months ago, and at that point there hadn't been significant re returns from, from those assets um, purchased under the um, asset purchase scheme. Some had, some hadn't. Um, I think it's important for us to review that scheme. We've had these changes in terms of public work loan board um, rules around um, investment in purely commercial schemes. Although this was never entirely intended to be about commercial schemes, there was an element of regeneration in there. It may be appropriate to continue the scheme, but it, it does need re reviewing in the light of changes over the last. Um, couple of years. Obviously, there hasn't been much of an opportunity to consider any purchases under the scheme and it, during the during the pandemic, it's not been a good good time to consider buying assets. But we will review it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the main paper? Okay, so um, Chair, um, uh, thank you. Um, Without the strategic asset purchase scheme, we wouldn't have a central water regeneration project because we wouldn't own the land, um, just as a basic fact, which I hope Councillor Cutler would agree with. Um, and um, we're only just getting um, in this budget to um, the um, <clears throat> refurbishment of some of the properties that were bought more than three years ago, 158, 159, 
High Street being examples of that. So I welcome uh, that coming onto the table. But could you just clarify why is it that a number of those assets that have sat around um, uh, the, the broader central Manchester scheme have not been um, looked at before and they're only just coming into this budget? Thank you. I think the events of the last two years have made it very, very difficult for us to, to, to make progress on, on, on that refurbishment. Uh, simple as simple as that. Any other questions on the main paper? Councillor Gomorrah. Yes, thank you. Um, so on page eighty one. Um, under the vibrant local economy. We've got an item in there of a provisional budget of five million uh, to redevelop the former goods shed site, um, et cetera, et cetera, which would generate an estimated surplus income of 50 to 70K per annum. Now, I just wanna, maybe I'm not understanding these figures, but when I divide five million by say 60,000, I get 83 years, and I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm assuming I'm misreading this this figure, and that there is more to this um, that would actually show a much quicker return than 83 years. Excuse my naivety. Thank you. I think we're talking about the surplus income over and above interest and minimum revenue provision in order to pay for. Uh, therefore, that's it's, it's the surplus income over and above. <clears throat> repayment costs. Over 40 years, I think we, we regard um, minimum revenue provision, but maybe 25. Uh, I think we, 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 do, we do have Neil Aitken on the line who, who drafted the budget this paper, so he, he, he will be able to clarify that for us. Neil, are you listening? It's already Yeah, sorry. Hello, yes, good evening. Um, I don't have the, the detailed workings to hand, but, but um, Councillor Cutler is correct in that it's the surplus income. I, I can't recall whether it's 30 years or 40 years, but if it were 40 years, then it would be a 2 million surplus over the 40 years, and we would have repaid the 5 million borrowing back over that time period. I'm, I'm reassured that um, this is a much better return than it looked. I just wonder. Uh, from the point of view of transparency with the public, I wonder if there's any way we can frame some of these things in a way that makes it obvious to someone who hasn't been trained on how to how to read the language. Just a request. Thank you. I had a question, if I may, on page 81, where it talks about a budget of 0.5 million being allocated for the demolition of Friarsgate Medical Centre. Now. I know an awful lot of people will be very supportive of the demolition of that. Um, and I see that the cost savings here are 64,000 per annum. But it was my understanding that it's far harder to get planning permission once the building's demolished, how you might like it, than it is if it's on the existing footprint. So I wondered if consideration has been given to the longer term costs that will be incurred mm -hmm. as a result of that demolition, as opposed to the short term gains, please. It's not a great idea asking me a planning question. <laughs> I did it on purpose. I feel I'm in the same position as the, the cabinet member. But, uh, <laughs> um, I know that has been explored in previous papers of the cabinet, but um, we'll, I'll, I can take that back and just, uh, just clarify that, that, that point. Yes, please. Just, just to check that it isn't short term <laughs> for long term costs. Thank you. Councillor. Councillor Horrell. Um, Chair, in this report, um, we hear more about the North Walls uh, Pavilion, which had started as a project um, run by enthusiasts locally, um, and uh, the increased costs that now are coming our way uh, to bring that to fruition. Um, but we don't seem to have, um, according to the paper, secured um, funding sources, which we had, I think, um, many months ago uh, indicated were an objective. Um, could um, Councillor Cutler confirm just how much we're prepared to put on the table uh, for that pavilion project to underwrite um, 
uh, the building. Again, I'd have to come back to you with that figure. I couldn't, couldn't give it to you uh, off the top of my head, but I think Mr. Both and Mark did. Chair, yeah, the, the town forum did determine to um, uh, undertake a redesign of, of uh, a refresh of the design of, 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 of the North Wall Pavilion in particular. Uh, we are in the process of, of completing that work as, as we speak. The funding that was identified by the town forum still stands. Um, we have lost, or we lost an opportunity, there was an opportunity lost by the, by the, the, the delay. So one, one grant funder has, has pulled away, and but others have stepped in. So you know, <coughs> that project is progressing subject to subject to detailed costings, but that the, the, the funds that were identified um, are, are, are still available to support that project. I think the comment is regarding seeking out funding is more in relation to the KGB pavilion. Um, and um, that, that funding has yet to be to, to, to be given. But with this this, this report you know, just uh, recommends some additional funding to just support that. Thank you. Councillor Godfrey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 11.7, the asset management strategy. Um, uh, about to be published, so I'm uh, assuming that, uh, uh, as it's referred to, the emerging AMS um, uh, is fairly well, uh, is fairly mature already. What's the uh, relationship between uh, the uh, asset management strategy and um, uh, the not yet started um, uh, strategic budget review um, and shouldn't one maybe be re reversed in uh, production that the AMS should um, follow the budget review rather than uh, the other way around? Uh, the work commenced on the asset management review long before um, we were in a position to um, say that we would be undertaking the strategic service review. The asset management review um, strategy will inform um, the strategic service review and may need revision as we go through through the, the review. I, 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 it is, as you say, it's a bit of a chicken and egg here, but the work has been done on the asset management um, strategy, and as you say, publication is imminent. It will inform the this, this, this strategic review. But there may be um, different approaches required once we come out of that review. I would uh, just as a supplementary point on that, we we, we have agreed with um, all the governance committee, and um, in fact, uh, following questions by Councillor Godfrey, that we would be consulting with that um, with members of that committee before publication, and we have yet to arrange that discussion. So that may be one of the sources of uh, Councillor Godfrey's questions. But uh, so that discussion will will take place before finalisation of the strategy and publication. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Chair. Um, page 81 and 82 refers to demolition of buildings, i.e. KGB Pavilion, and we talk about River Park. Are we making sure when we carry out this demolition, that it does happen, that we will try and retrieve as much of the, 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 the building as possible, I mean, other bricks, etc., to, re to recycle? Somebody that one. Thank you. I mean that, that would be very much subject to the uh, the, the individual specifications for, for, for those works. Um, whether there's anything that is worth saving or, or reusing, then obviously every 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 time would be made to do would be made to do that. Whether there's too much of that from some of those buildings um, remains to be seen. Certainly the KGB pavilions, I think, are, um, are, are well beyond their useful life and. Uh, uh, have, a bit of, have a bit of timber, there's not much brick in there at all. Really. So, um, but so, certainly the, the best method of disposal of, of, of demolition and disposal would be considered as part of that process. Councillor Hall. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Botham will know I'm always retrieved when I see the housing company in a report, um, and now we're reduced to um, one million. Um, can you please um, uh, help me to understand what, what are we actually getting now for our one million? Um, 
Sure, we have uh, taken papers through uh, the policy committee and we're due to bring a final paper um, that will go to policy committee as well but before com before covenant um, with the final business case for the housing company. It is proposed to be a, a, a effectively a leasing model rather than a purchase model now. It will achieve the same aims. It's, it's, its primary function will be to support um, mixed in your housing as part of the wind, the wind development which is currently underway. Um, what the um, the um, previous scheme allocated money from the capital programme to invest funds to go out and actually fund a building, purchase buildings. That, that's what they, that is not the, that is no longer the the assessed as the most cost effective way of, of managing that, that housing. At least building it in the housing revenue account, leasing it to a company is is a more cost effective way. With subject to the final business case and being being approved by members, what the million pound does is it does give some capacity for the company to operate um, potentially purchase a small number of properties, properties or whatever. But it isn't going to be the primary function. Either. Previously, it was about generating capital to run the company, and the company will not be it's more of a, a, a revenue based than a capital base. Councillor Moore. Um, Chair, why are we spending 397000 on the West Wing refurbishment when we're about to rent it out? Chair, that, that um, a provision that we've retained in, in the programme because we, we, knew, we know there are most of the building and in particular the lift, which will remain our responsibility as part of any of any of these. Um, it's probably more than we need, but that's why it's in the subject to appraisal section rather than the, uh, um, the, the, the firm proposals. But, uh, but that's the, effectively, it's the lift is the key part of that. Thank you. Any further questions on the bait before we go on to the appendices, Carol? Uh, Councillor Hall. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 83, we talk about the Winchester Movement Strategy, which we know is sort of coming through to the next stage. And we're always told that um, a lot of these projects need um, money, they need grants. A um, couple of elements indicated here in the paper the uh, let money and sell. Um, but we don't have anything else in our own budget for any um, investigations or trials. Uh, particularly as we, we saw um, earlier. So could I um, perhaps uh, better understand why the movement strategy has no allocation of monies in this budget? I, I think the, the it's quite difficult to allocate money when you have absolutely no schemes to allocate it to. I mean, we could put a figure in there, um, but I, I think the intention of the movement strategy is is very much around its work that Hampshire County Council will, will be doing. Um, the SIL and LET money may be for specific schemes, possibly public realm schemes, that, that would be attached to it. But my colleague here is far more up to the detail of, of the movement strategy. Yeah, the movement strategy is currently being consulted on the next round of work, the LC WIP and all of that kind of stuff. And the output of that is a set of bid grade um, information that can be used primarily to bid for the very large sums of money that are potentially available for walking and cycling and other similar um, initiatives. Also, city centre regeneration from central governments, and that is very much our focus because the ambition that we have for a lot of the schemes is very large uh, and it will require significant sums of money, all slightly dependent on um, uh, levelling up, meaning that Winchester and Hampshire are being levelled down. Um, uh, we certainly have had conversations in the past about use of SIL and other capital funding to enable projects as they come forward and I think we would intend to continue doing so um, as needed but we certainly the primary focus will continue to be seeking money from central government. I mean just for perspective in terms of how highways funding works, um, when I last looked at Hampshire's environment transport economy budget for uh, next financial year um, 37 of 110 million was unidentified grant-based funding um, and for the following year I think it is currently 79 of 110 million is something like that is unidentified so it, people are quite used to the idea um, in ETE the environment transport economy part of Hampshire that 
um, you have to make bids at short notice with information that you've previously pulled together. Um, what we are doing that is very successful at the moment, and a good example of this would be the Stockbridge Road steps, is there we were using work that had been done, I think it's part of the station approach, um, to lever in funding from Network Rail, from Hampshire and from ourselves. Um, we made the initiative to put the bid into the Southwestern Community Something Something Fund. Um, and ended up paying 50 of a £600,000 scheme. Um, and I think that is how we intend to be using our funding as far as we're possible, able to in the future. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Todd. Any other questions on the paper before we move to appendices? No? Okay. So coming on to Appendix A on page 95 and 96. Councillor Hall. Um, Chair, there are a huge number, I think, in fact, Councillor Cutler referred to uh, it earlier, that we have a, a significant number of assets as a, as a council um, in very better, much better shape than um, some of our neighbouring authorities. Um, and yet um, we don't see many of them listed here to try and drive forward opportunities to deliver new benefits to the district. Um, and um, assets that we have some value in if we decided to realise them. Um, for example, station approach, uh, which we could realise a value to the work that has already been invested in that. Um, is there a reason, uh, Councillor Cutler, why uh, a number of those um, have not made the list um, at this time um, in uh, uh, the next budget or indeed in the foreseeable future? When you say a number, you gave one example, I just wondered if you had any others. Um, the cattle market, station approach. So you're, you're actually specifically asking about those two? There are... Uh, no, Councillor Cutler, there are, there are a number. I think the broad principle question was um, that we have other assets that we could realise benefits from over the period of this um, appendix but um, we haven't included them in any shape or form to bring them to any value for this council. I think it's very, very difficult to put figures on non-existent schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, there is no scheme. Um, so, so, so it would be wrong to put in um, a guesstimate over a period of time period of time, we will be bringing forward over time, once we've um, <laughs> stabilised post-pandemic, I think, um, schemes for those areas, but um, it's a question of capacity within the, within the council, and um, it would be wrong to put speculative figures into the capital strategy. Any further questions on Appendix A? <coughs> Appendix B then, page 97. Appendix C on page 99. Appendix D, page 101. And Appendix E. Page 103 and 104. Councillor Power. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a very quick question on public works um, building loan rates. What is the prediction and degree of certainty for rates in the next 10 years or so? If I knew, I'd be a very rich man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's very, very difficult. We will we'll take the advice of um, our and Cozal advisors on, on, on that. Uh, at the moment, there's not huge movement, I don't think, but um, again, it's around the inflation forecast. And, um, it's very, very difficult to judge where they will be. 
I think your supplementary will then lead on to um, whether it's worth borrowing now at low rates and um, there is the whole question of cost of carry and that's an assessment we do need to make over the next few months um, in terms of we don't need to borrow at the moment but, and so there is a cost of borrowing early. Chairman, I agree that we've reversed that cost of carry in many different meetings and we are familiar with the uh, parameters. Um, I, I, it would be nice to have certainty. Thank you. <laughs> I can buy a good crystal ball. <laughs> um, OK, Appendix F then, page 105 to 112. Do we have any questions on Appendix F? No. OK, any debate on this paper at all? Councillor Hall. Chair, thank you. Um, I suppose, I'd, again, I thank the officers for pulling all of this together, some very detailed analysis. So thank you to all of you, most of you listening online, uh, as well as Mr. Botham in the room. Um, it, it's rather disappointing that we have a, a number of assets um, that we're not uh, listing here in the capital investment strategy. And I hope that given it's through to 2032, I'm hoping that when we have the financial uh, strategic review, we will look um, more positively at some of the assets that we have and how we can bring value and opportunities to the district as a consequence. So that's not necessarily selling them, it might be redeveloping them, it might be um, adding to them to, to provide better services to our residents. Um, and it feels to me as if this is um, slightly understated in the opportunities that we might bring to bear um, and that we haven't uh, explored a number of projects that are already in the draw and indeed others that might um, come forward in the future. So I'm hoping that uh, the work uh, that follows um, on the, the broader assessment of our finances uh, might um, uh, uh, bring uh, more opportunities to the table that we can um, all review. Thank you. Agreed, Councillor Harrell. There is an awful lot of time and, and work that's gone into this paper, and, and I too was disappointed to see the lack of ambition with regard to the investment to to um, bolster our finances at this time. Any Councillor Power? <coughs> Chairman, thank you. I have to counter Councillor Harrell's point. I am very well aware that um, having too many balls in the air at the time is not a happy place to be. Just looking at the one um, line on the capital programme that's very close to my heart, the 1.05 million for the new car park in the Dean, I think we've all been working on that for about 10 years with a varying degree of certainty and um, changes in what will be delivered for how much. You do have to manage what the number of projects you can have on the boil at the same time in order to give stability and certainty to a capital programme. I would not wish to see any more forecast active products, products, projects than we have at the moment on this list. Thank you. Any other debate on this paper? No? Okay then, um, so we don't have any specific points I've taken down that we're feeding into cabinet on this one. So if everybody's happy that we've noted, unless you can pull out that I've missed some vital snippet that I said I'd note. <laughs> no? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item nine, Treasury uh, Management Strategy, pages 130 to 144, report SC060 and CAB 3333. Um, recommendation again for us to comment to come to Cabinet on the 17th of February. Councillor Cutler, am I coming to you again? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a requirement of the SIPFA Treasury Management Code that all councils have to approve a Treasury Management Strategy. Uh, the strategy set out in this report has been produced with input from Hampshire County Council Investments and Borrowing Team who manage the cash balances um, the investment of a 
of surplus cash and sourcing of short-term borrowing, and also with the input of on <coughs> the Council's Treasury advisors. The strategy sets up the forecast borrowing need based on the capital investment strategy and the general fund and HRA budgets and medium-term financial strategy. Um, it sets up the borrowing strategy, the investment strategy, and the Treasury management prudential indicators. Uh, the key changes to the strategy um, since last year is that investment limits have been amended to reflect the higher investment balances expected to be held primarily due to slippage in the capital program as a consequence of the global transportation and supply issues. This will enable the Council to take advantage of high yielding investments over longer periods. Um, members of the finance team, I think, are still with us if um, there are further questions. Thank you, Councillor Cutler. Um, so again, we'll come to the main paper, pages 115 to 140 of our agenda packs. Does anybody have any questions on the main paper? Councillor Godfrey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, page 128, um, paragraph 16.17, um, is in a section dealing with approved property funds um, that uh, uh, refers to IFRS 9, the accounting standard, um, <coughs> where uh, the, the variation in the capital values of investments in the um, included in uh, uh, the revenue accounts in the future year. I think from my reading, uh, it will be starting next year, um, for this time next year. Um, I agree with that, that start date is, uh, can be confirmed. Um, and what the implications are for um, both the pools in uh, uh, property funds and other uh, investments that um, the City Council has. Will they all need to be shown uh, about capital values uh, or just certain categories, uh, certain types of uh, investment? Thank you. <coughs> I wonder if Neil Aitken is still on the call, that he can give some detail behind that. Are you, are you still muted now? Sorry. Um, I'll start again. Um, the, um, it, it, it's any pooled investment fund, uh, but for, in Winchester's case, we only have one pooled investment fund, which is the CCLA fund. Um, and it, it, essentially what it means is, as you can appreciate, we get an income from the fund, but the capital value moves every year. If we had to inc 